I am home for a while. Um, suddenly, I don't know why exactly, but we have the month at home. And uh, it's nice. We've been working hard. Uh, we were out all summer. And... And I did some shows with the Violent Femmes in the last few weeks, um, which was really fun to sit in with them. Uh, I loved those guys for a long time. You, you you sat in on the trio? Were you a quartet? Uh, let's see. It's uh, Gordon and Brian, and then the drummer, John Sparrow, and a saxophonist, named uh blaze garza and i play and i play accordion with them in my mind they're a, a, a trio I, I, th I think they were for a long time maybe yeah that was kind of the classic lineup that's interesting you know a band you know i assume that the four of them have worked together for a while now what's it like being that extra ingredient oh they're kindred spirits and i i played with them enough that i know the ropes and i really enjoy uh, their spirit of adventure in their live shows. Uh, every night's a bit different. They go, you know, there's moments in each song where they go outside and, and actually play together. You know, there's no click track. There's no um, tracks. Uh, it's really live and organic, and it's a lot of fun. I've seen some footage of the Bare Naked Ladies playing live and um, some of the summer shows, and it seems like there's when you're playing acoustically that you're, you're capturing a little bit of that, or, you know, at least sort of like a little kind of a, like a more even traditional country and Western band. Yeah. That's kind of our roots. The band started as a, as an acoustic organic band and we try to stay in touch with that and uh, incorporate it into our shows. When did the transition to being more, I guess, more rock forward happen? Well, I think um, our records started having songs that had, you know, more production qualities, um, using drum loops, drum machines, um, m more layers of synthesizers and guitars. And uh, I think to present those songs uh, live, uh, it's fun to play them stripped down too, but, you know, I think we kind of liked the idea of presenting the songs uh, closer to how they sounded on the records. And so there's, there's definitely a few songs that we, we use track and click track for. Was that around what the, was that in the nineties, mid nineties? Yeah, it was probably when we started, uh, working with Gavin Brown around the time of, uh, like, um, a, an album called Grinning Streak. And you have songs like Odds Are that have an arpeggiator keyboard that is time locked into the, the tempo of the drums. And so to play it live, I had to be locked in and it all, uh, it sort of just mutated into that. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, because we were talking about the Violet Femmes, but, you know, this is an instance, it sounds like, where you weren't, you weren't there from the beginning. Obviously, you've been there for a long time and it was still, you know, fairly early on, but. Anytime you add or subtract a member, it's going to change the dynamic a little bit, and that it 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 strikes me because you're you know you're mentioning keyboards and electronic elements that you you had a pretty big influence on that direction. Uh, yeah, the first studio record I took part in was a record called Stunt, and that was sort of the record that broke the band in the USA. And something I brought to the table was more um, more electronic sounds and more found sounds and created sounds. Um, you know, when when he sings, Bert Kampfer's got the mad hits, and you hear the horn shot. That was, you know, me doing little samples in the back room of the studio. It was a Bert Kampfer sample. Yeah. And we actually approached them to make sure it was okay, and they said it was so short that they didn't care. <laughs> so that was was good. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you know, there's a song on that record called "When You Dream," and I um, I sampled each of the guys singing, like a, just a note, ah, and then a bit higher, a bit higher, 
and I put them all into my uh, Roland S760 sampler and uh, layered them and added some reverb. And so the the backing vocals you hear in that song are actually really like a I'm playing them like on a keyboard. Obviously, there's a lot of very good singers in the band. Um, was that just a was that just a bit of experimentation on your part? Yeah, just having fun, you know, trying things and uh, f- finding a way to, you know, explore the sound of the band uh, in a different way. When you enter a band like that, because they were, it seems like you kind of stepped onto a rocket ship at that point, especially since the first first record that you played on was, you know, ha- ha- has this huge hit. And as you said, like really uh establishes the band down here it is you know when when you when you first join the group is do you want to just sort of you want to fit in as well as possible or is it important to i guess leave your mark early on uh, i wasn't thinking in that terms i was just uh you know they told me they wanted me to do it and they knew who i was they knew what kind of work i did and they encouraged me to be myself and they seemed genuinely excited when I would bring ideas like that to the table because I don't think that there was really anyone in the band who was doing that, you know? And I think it helped bring sort of a contemporary flavor to what they were doing. And also when I joined, we were still playing clubs in the USA and it was, it didn't, quite feel like a rocket ship yet uh, in the USA. It, it, we were very much still building our audience down there. Is it that story of like, you know, f- however many years, you know, they say like 10 years to be an overnight success. Was it that kind of feeling? Uh, yeah, it was, there was a momentum that we had to, uh, we had to commit to and keep going down there and follow up and stay on the radar and each time we'd go, we'd find we would play the next biggest venue in that city. Whereas there were people in the industry that might have been, uh, you know, willing to write us off as a novelty group because there was humor in our songs. They couldn't deny that, you know, we were filling the clubs and then the theaters. And so we started getting radio station involvement we started having to go visit the radio stations every city we went to. Um, I say having to, but it was an honor and a pleasure, you know. But uh, And that really got the record company on board as well. And it was sort of developed in this, into this kind of perfect storm of support and excitement for the band. Uh, so when we released that record stunt, it... Uh, it was like lighting the kindling, you know. I've always wondered that about bands, whether whether there's an extent to which, you know, having a having a sense of humor, or having funny songs, like ultimately works against you. Sure. Well, I think Frank Zappa talked a lot about that, you know. <laughs> Does humor belong in music? And I think he had a record called Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't just the humor, though, that, that, that I think had made him have trouble breaking through. Like, I think he was a, uh, intentionally in- inaccessible <laughs> musician. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it was the humor that was the most accessible part of what he was putting out. Uh, for us, I think our calling card, um, if you hadn't seen our show, it was usually a humorous song you might hear like one week or if I had a million dollars and some people were put off by that. But if you, if you dig deeper into our um, records, you'll find songs like The Flag or, um, you know, there's many that are more serious and uh, more rooted in a, uh, as you said, country and Western tradition. And I think that's that's what's helped the band last as long as it has, is that there's actual uh, substance there and, and care given into the songwriting. We hear a lot of these stories about bands who their biggest hit is a novelty song and then like their entire, the rest of their catalog is just completely different from that. And, and, and they're like cursed with the the one sure. funny song that they did out there. But um, you didn't really have that problem because, you know, 
that level of humor and that level of kind of uh, playfulness it, like permeates the catalog. Sure. What's your favorite band? My favorite band, just my favorite bands. Uh, yeah. I would say Pavement. They had wow. a novelty hit actually. Now that I know that now that I'm saying it, they, that "Cut Your Hair" was their big hit song, and it was a you know it was a goofy song. He's an amazing lyricist, though. Yeah, I love Shady Lane. Yeah, I love that band too. Since I got you, what's your favorite band? Well, my hero growing up was Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. So I probably put them on top and I ended up working with Lou, which was an honor. Um, and today I was listening to the new Beatles single and yeah, and it sent shivers, you know, I got shivers and it really reminded me of how that band really inspired me to be a musician in the first place. I will admit that I wasn't super impressed on first listen, but the the thing that really got me was when that the George guitar part comes in towards the end. Yeah, like that I was like, oh, okay, this is <laughs> this is the real deal. <laughs> yeah, it was beautiful. I just I love John's voice and the melody he's singing. You know, I I kind of felt like it started feeling a little overproduced in in places, but. Uh, but how I can't complain. The Lou Reed story is an is an amazing one to me, and you know, and it does really dovetail with the period of the band's you know breakthrough success that we were just talking about. Which, I mean, on top of being extremely sick, which is obviously horrible in and of itself, you've. It's God. This is going to sound terrible, but it's happening at a very inopportune time. Oh, you mean my my connection with Lou started when I was sick? You mean, and that being sick um, happened like right in that period of the band taking off. Oh yeah, it was crazy. I was having a a bone marrow transplant the same day that one week went to number one on the Billboard charts. And it seemed like a really cruel joke at the time, yeah. but it also really acted as a a, motiva a motivator, you know, to get back to my life. It was like, no, I deserve to be out there playing uh, music and enjoying, uh, you know, what I worked for for so many years. And um, it really helped me, in a way, get back to my life. I, I hear a lot of stories from people about going through similar things and it really you know in, in much the same way that you were describing kind of reconnecting with the beatles of you know the reason why you had to reconnect with the beatles is because we we take the beatles for granted because they're the beatles they you know they've been around forever and it's like it's like breathing air and it, it's really easy in life to start to take things for granted and the stories that i've heard from people who have been through those sorts of difficult sicknesses, you know, when they come out on the other side, there's just this newfound appreciation for everything. Absolutely. And most of all time, you know, I used to think of ideas, creative ideas and think, Oh, I'll do that down the road somewhere. One day I'm going to make a record uh, on a piano in a, in a church or whatever those ideas might be. But once you've been through a serious health crisis and get back to the land of the living, you're like, okay, the time is now. And so that's why my work ethic is, uh, you know, I work too hard, but <laughs> that's why I just, I want to get the things done that I, I want to do. Looking at your career, it looks like you've always been a, even before the bare naked ladies, you were a, a hard worker. Uh, that's true. Yeah. You what? You went double time, yeah. though, when when this happened? I think so. I think with the success of the band, I, I might have had the opportunity to, to do less, you know. But I kind of took what I earned in the band and put it into other projects that I wanted to, um, to do and creative avenues I wanted to explore. And uh, that took time and energy, but uh, it's very fulfilling to me. And I 
continue to learn a lot from it and bring that back to projects I work on with other people like the band. In that case, in that instance, in that specific period of time, um, you know, did, did, did you feel like you, you should be focused on the band solely and really sort of, I guess, striking while the iron is hot? Um, it, it, it sounds like you had time to work on other things during it. Well, while I was um, going through my transplant and recovering, I, I couldn't really be on the road. So I, I went into the studio whenever I was feeling well enough, and I made a record called H-Wing, which was about my you know, experience and my journey. And I made it with a guy named Jeremy Darby, who had, was an amazing engineer, still is. But uh, he had uh, worked with Lou Reed for many years. And if you look at a record called Songs for Drella, he was the engineer. He was the only other person in the room uh, with Lou Reed and John Cale. And he he sent my record H-Wing to Lou, and Lou wrote to me and said he really loved it and said, Kevin, you've gone somewhere most people don't come back from to report on it, and you've made something really beautiful. And that was kind of the start of our friendship. And um, you never know with these these projects what door might open, who might hear it. You know, it's quite a fascinating thing. Uh, given that subject matter, was it a difficult album to write and record? It sure was. Um, at the same time, it it, uh, it helped me feel like myself. It helped me connect with my friends who wanted to be there for me, and some of them could in a in a musical way more than any other way. And I also knew I had to do it then because I'd never be able to really feel that way again. I had to do it while I was in the moment and had those memories pretty fresh, you know. I really like that idea of of reporting back. I, I, you know, I think you put it really well. Did, did that feel like an accurate assessment of what you were doing? Well, Lou certainly had a way of putting things well. Uh, <laughs> more than any other person I've ever met. But uh, um, I hadn't thought of it that way until he articulated it that way. And now I think of it that way. It makes total sense to me. He, yeah, nail on the head. That must have been a highlight, like a highlight among highlights, having, you know, your favorite musician and your favorite bands give you that kind of feedback. Yeah, it's hard to put into words what that what that means to me, you know, and it it was the start of my friendship with Lou. We started a back and forth and. Then one day he said, Kevin, why don't you come to New York and let's see if we can play together. <laughs> um, so I ended up going down to New York and auditioning for Lou in Mike Rathke's kitchen. It clicked? It did, yeah. I think he, he really appreciated that I knew every single one of his songs. And, you know, I, I played one song called I Remember from the Mistrial record. And he said, Kevin, no one knows that song except you, me, and Seven Seagulls. <laughs> was that a strategic decision on your part to pick like a super obscure track? No, it wasn't strategic. I was just, uh, it was like a dream come true that I was jamming with Lou in a kitchen. And uh, I played that song as a camp counselor. I would played it with friends. I, it's just one of those songs I kind of always played because I liked it. And uh, so I just played it because I wanted to play it with him. And I had the opportunity. I was right there with him. And so why not, you know? And he, I think he liked that. I think he liked that I was comfortable enough to just sort of take the wheel a little bit. Certainly not everyone would be in, in that situation. Um, you know, he's he's somebody... I assume that if I, I never, I, I think I passed him on the street in Manhattan a couple of times. I never actually met him, but meeting somebody like that, that I would just sort of be deferential to them. Yeah. And part of me was freaking out, but you know, <laughs> um, the other part was just trying to be myself, you know, cause I, I knew if I was myself that I'd, I'd be okay. Yeah. I like that too. It, you know, it's, it's like 
I may never have a chance to play with Lou Reed again. This is an audition, so I might as well play the songs that I want to play. Yeah. It's nice to hear something like that about somebody like him, because like, he has kind of a reputation for being a little, a little gruff on the side, but he didn't really experience that at all. No, he was always kind to me. And, you know, he could be grumpy and difficult, but he had a good heart and uh, I loved him very much and I miss him very much. And I'll always defend him till my dying day. (laughs) You know, he didn't suffer fools. And if you said something, you know, stupid to him, he would he he would call you out on it and he could be mean. You know, I, I witnessed it, but never with me. Treated me like a son. I mean, you were really playing with him at the end of his life. Yeah, I was with him till the end. Yeah, we were gonna we were gonna play at Coachella, and uh, we were actually getting ready to do rehearsals, and then that's uh, that never happened. Him having first reached out to you because of this you know, life threatening disease that you have and then in in a sense sort of almost like coming full circle um did you get the sense at the time that him sort of knowing what was ahead had an impact on his music well i know the last few tours i did with him i think he was aware uh, he was dealing with with health issues, and I know he was loving it and putting everything into every single show. So that was quite something to see and be a part of. And there's a new book uh, about Lou's life that a guy named Will Hermes wrote, and in it he talks about, well, I did an interview with Will, and... You know, Lou called me and said, hey, I got some bad news. I know you've been through this. And uh, so I, the roles kind of got reversed and I I became sort of a a friend supporting him in the end, which was a a real honor. Yeah. There's a level of, not that you have to experience something like this, but I do think that there's a level of empathy and compassion that comes with going through an experience like that because you know you were you were similarly very supportive of Gord Downey at the end of his life that's right yeah I was and that was an honor too you I mean it sounds it sounded like you you almost like turned your house into a studio for him I did yeah you can see behind me here this is where we rehearsed the secret path I didn't, you know, I wanted to get the band up and running so we weren't wasting his time at rehearsals. So I suggested I do three or maybe four workshop days with the band here in my living room. And then we were going to move into a normal sort of rehearsal space, one that you rent, you know, that's equipped with a PA and can fit crew and stuff um so i thought the band was coming here to my place and they did but gord came as well he didn't want to miss any of it and (laughs) at the end of uh you know the second day he said kevin i don't want to leave i I love it here can we just stay here and (laughs) so (laughs) that wasn't a hard decision for you was it uh, no, of course not. I, I would have done anything for him, you know, I, and uh, I, I loved it. And we had a great time. I get the sense that similar to Lou, like, he wanted to make the most out of every minute he had. Absolutely. And they were very, they were similar in the sense that they were both poets. And it was similar in the sense that I could empathize with them from the point of view of a, a cancer survivor and an artist and a musician and a father too. Right. I mean, that, that must play a pretty big role in, in this kind of compassion that you have. I suppose so. Yeah. I mean, 
Lou, Lou didn't have children, but Gord certainly did. And I do, you know, I have a, a, a special daughter. So I, uh, I guess I, some people have said that I'm an empath. And I think that's a great compliment. If that's so, that's nice. I think it is a compliment. And I think everything I know about you, that it's true, but it's also something that I, I you know, I, I, I experience empathy or, or compassion on a level that like sometimes makes me uncomfortable, you know, so like, you know, yeah, on a human level, you can't, you can't help, but, um, not want someone to suffer, you know, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist myself and I have a, uh, uh, one of my close friends is also a journalist and we talk about this all the time of, because you know, I I think she's she's similar in, in that respect. Of it's real hard to to cover the news. You know, it's real hard to to be tuned into the news all day when when you feel things like that. Because you know, I don't know. These days, think things feel different, and maybe part of it is the way that news is delivered. But it just it sure feels like a constant barrage of really terrible things happening all the time. Sure does. Yeah. Heartbreaking and overwhelming. Yeah. I think it's important to allow ourselves, you know, still moments of joy and playfulness, um, you know, when when we have the opportunity. I feel like in a sense, in, not even in a sense, in a very real way, the lead off track for the most from the most recent Bare Naked Ladies album is 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 exactly that. It's almost like defiantly positive. Uh, yeah, love and life. Yeah, I mean, is it a sense of just like uh, of of not? I mean, I I know it wasn't one that that you penned personally, but it is it a sense of um, not wanting to wallow in that anymore? I think so. I think it's you know expressing deep gratitude for what we have and. Uh, not being not being dragged down and and allowing Ed allowing himself to proclaim that that it's love and life it's great but even gratitude is a great thing and i and i know i i went over this a little bit before but you know it's it's not always easy certainly i mean certainly there are nights and i'm sure that there are shows and you know there are tours and every band has, has a top that they hit, like, you know, I coming down from that, obviously the band has remained very successful, but coming down from that even a little bit, like is a challenge, I imagine. Sure. And, and Ed's not, uh, I know Ed well, he's had a lot of challenges in life and he's had dark times and he's, he's transcended a lot personally. And so, you know, I, I'm happy for him that he can express himself that way and, and appreciate the good things and appreciate his life. It's incredible watching you guys interact because it seems like you still really like each other, which is can be very rare in this industry. Ah, we love each other. We're, we're like brothers. And then we, you know, we hate each other like brothers. <laughs> I mean that in a light sense, you know, like, you know, we're, we're together all the time, but at the end of the day, we love each other and we still enjoy doing what we do in our show and making each other laugh and goofing around and that the audiences uh, enjoy that. So they keep coming to see us. Thank goodness. I say this all the time. Um, I, I feel like being in a band you know, I, I always say that the, the the best way to test a relationship is to to move in with somebody. You know, to to be in close quarters with them. A lot of people, a lot of people had that exact test during the the pandemic. And um, the best way to know if you're gonna if you should be in a band with somebody is to you know put yourself in the back of a van with them and and drive a you know drive around the continent. I remember I was having um, lunch with a keyboardist named Robert Jan Stips 
from a, a band called The Knits. And uh, this was many years ago, but he said, there's a lot more to being in a band than making music with someone. Um, you also have to be able to sit in a restaurant and have a meal with that person. You know, does that work? Because <laughs> if, if that doesn't work, then, um, you know, you're not going to last long. You knew the guys before you joined, but it, it sounds like this was pretty much baked in from the beginning for you. Yeah, I didn't know them too well, but uh, they were kindred spirits. And I'd worked with comedy groups. I had grown up with my cousin, Harland Williams, who's a comedian. I worked in a band called Look People, who who were very uh, prog rocky, uh, very um, kind of Zappa-esque in their musical arrangements, which were very serious even though the lyrics were silly. And I was in a band called the Rio Statics that were quite serious instrumentally. And the band liked all those groups. And so I think we kind of knew each other, even though um, we didn't. I have to admit that before I knew this interview was happening and I read into you a little bit, I wasn't familiar with the look people. And I think that it's one of those, I, I think it's just one of those like, being an American, just certain things, you know, <laughs> certain things just don't, 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 uh, don't come through. But you did have a, you, you had a, a bit of success with that group. Oh, yeah. We were well known in Canada and a, a big champion and fan of the band way back in the early 90s was Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And he actually got us on the bill, uh, at Lollapalooza in Los Angeles. Um, so we were kind of, we, we had our foot in the door a little bit in the States. And our last show was in LA at a, a place called Club Lingerie. And it was very strange that night, but that was our last show. And so it was interesting that we ended everything in the United States. <laughs> Did you know it was the last show going into it? No. It was just the last show of our tour, and then things kind of fell apart after that. After I'd been in the band uh, eight years. But, you know, we were um, uh, not very accessible and slash ahead of our time, however which way you want to look at it. But... Uh, after uh, so shortly after we broke up, a band called Primus came out, and they were actually doing like kind of similar music, and and I think we would have done better had we just been a little later. <laughs> it's, it's wild in hindsight that Primus was, I'm, you know, obviously they're all really talented musicians, but that they managed to break through. <laughs> it's, it's it's kind of yeah. incredible when you really think about it. It's cool. Yeah, I think people's tastes changed. And I think people were smart and more open to interesting music. I mean, you know, the Violet Femmes had had success, too. And they, you know, they were pretty out there. That's true. That is a good point. But man, some of their songs were just very simple and very catchy. Blister in the Sun. And yeah, that's undeniable. I think Primus really benefited from that that period that period of activity in the nineties, you know, the sort of what ended up being the last gasp of record labels, you know, when they they were willing to sort of go out and and try anything. And and I d I don't know, you you probably got swept up in that a bit as well. Oh sure. We had full record company support for um for stunt. And yeah, we, we certainly experienced that. And then we experienced the downside, uh, when everything kind of went downhill, when, you know, Napster came out and all that started happening. And, um, what a ride. It's still going. How, how did you navigate that period? The, the downslope? Uh, mm, well. I know that we started making records and putting them out ourselves. Like we became sort of an indie operation 
for a few records and uh, just drew strength from ourselves in that and worked with the people we had picked and sort of just kept our shoulder to the wheel, so to speak. In the case, it's, it, you know, it, I think it, it takes a lot of willpower um, for a band to have a massive song and not try to repeat that formula exactly. You know, one, 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 one hopefully not. One, yeah, yeah. I mean, one week is, you know, very, very, you know, it, idiosyncratic song, I would say. Was there. Was there at least pressure from the label to do that again? I think so, yeah. From, from my point of view, they they suddenly shifted their focus to that aspect of the band. Um, but that aspect of the band wasn't just out of the blue. Like, that is something we did every night in our shows. Ed would freestyle, and Steve would join in as well. He wouldn't really... He, he might sing a little more than Ed, but they were both making up words on the spot about whatever, you know, came to our minds at that time. And the song One Week was really Ed, Ed doing that, you know, that's how he wrote it. So it, it wasn't like a, a strange thing to want to do that again. And we have done that since. And it hasn't felt like we're trying to recapture uh, anything. It's just part of our, part of who we are, part of our DNA. I know that you're still very close with, with Steve as well. When, you know, th this really tight group of guys, you know, one who's been there since the beginning, like leaves, is that, is it still clear that the band continues? Well, certainly we had to have a few heart to hearts and all that. Some, but yeah, we, we all loved the band and wanted to continue and were excited about the possibilities and also afraid. And, you know, it was, it wasn't, it was a tough time, but, uh, there was also a bit of a relief because things had sort of not been great. You know, our, our show does actually rely on us genuinely making each other laugh and, and enjoying each other's company. And so if it starts feeling forced, like I think it w it was eventually, it wasn't good. You know, we weren't enjoying it as much. So. I don't see Steve every day or talk to him every day, but we, we send the odd message back and forth and, wish him well when he achieves something and, and vice versa. You know, when I was sick, he came and visited me every day in the hospital, you know, so I'll never forget that. It is clear, though, at the time that that he's not going to be replaced, that nobody can replace him in the band. I don't think uh, we're happy with, with uh, how things have um, grown. You alluded to the possibilities. Um what does that mean exactly? You know, what, what doors open up? Yeah, you know, it was just we talked and said, how, what do, how do we want to move forward? What do we want to do? And, you know, it was very much still we want to be a band. And Jim and I bring songs to the table for every record. And, you know, we each kind of stepped up in a different way. And that was a big motivator for you as far as um, bringing your songs to the group. Well, I, I, um, yeah, I consider myself a songwriter and, you know, I was, I was bringing songs to the group before that, but, uh, certainly now things were a bit different and I kind of get to sing my own songs now as well, which is kind of nice. Although I loved when Steve sang my songs, you know, it was a great singer. Is it clear after every record that there's absolutely going to be another one? I just take it one day at a time, you know. I, you know, will there be another record? Will I live, be alive next week? You know, <laughs> there's more important questions. 